Good everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us for today's webinar on the project for developing innovative mobility solutions for the Brussels capital region. Uh, my name is Orla McCarthy. I am the project manager for the International Transport Forum on this project, and I will be moderating today's discussion. This project is carried out with funding by the European Union via their structural reform support programme and in cooperation with the European Commission, and the project will run until next summer. I am very pleased to see such a strong interest from stakeholders in the region. Uh, the more stakeholders that we can engage as this work continues, the stronger the outputs will be at the end of the project. And I am delighted to have with us Minister Elke van den Brandt uh, of the government of the Brussels capital region, who has responsibility for mobility, public works and road safety. We will also have a video message from the Director General of DG Reform, Mario Nava, and Jung Tae Kim, the Secretary General of the International Transport Forum, will offer introductory remarks from the ITF. I hope that those of you watching will find today's webinar interesting and will be inspired to engage with us further as the project continues. But without further ado, I will ask Minister Van der Brandt to please officially open the webinar. Minister. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me and, and especially for organizing uh, this webinar. I would say uh, welcome to Brussels, even if it's virtual. I'm having some part of Brussels behind me. So I hope we can all feel a bit uh, together tonight, even when the distance might be far away. Um, I think Brussels for the moment is, is at the turning point of, of our mobility culture. We, we are perhaps known for chocolate and beer, but we're also known for hosting quite an amount of traffic jams. And that is a part of the reputation that we would like to lose. We think um, there is a need to shift from a city that is quite car centered to a city for people going in on. And, and the regional government wants to offer everybody who, who lives and works here a better life environment, which is a uh, start from, of course, a variety of choice of effective mobility solutions, because we know that mobility, it's not a problem, it is a solution. If we organize our mobility different, if we take other choices, then we can create a city which is um, much more pleasant to live in, much more healthy to live in, much more agreeable to come and visit because we really hope to have uh, tourists coming back again and people working again and returning to, to uh, the capital of Europe uh, as soon as, as the coronavirus virus, uh, leaves us. So I, I, we do want to make a city that is um, welcoming people and that is changing its habits and its, its old uh, attitudes towards um, the way we, we use the city and we transport um, one another in this city. Um, I think for decades mobility was, was a story of, of giving more and more and more space to cars and at the moment we are about 70% of our public space that is dedicated to individual cars in, in car lanes or in parking spaces and so we created a mobility uh, plan which is called Good Move and we received a SUMP award recently for it and we're very uh, proud of that of course um, and that's really to, to give a final term to, to this culture and, and we have decided to use a stop principle, principle uh, the, as really as a red line in our policy that say first we, we take care of pedestrians of walking then cyclists who are cycling then the public transport and then the individu in, individual uh, transport and um, that principle will enhance the modal shift and we do that because we know it's good for the climate it's good for the way we move but it's also good for the quality of life in our city because all the space we can recreate in this way can be used for pedestrian areas for little um, playgrounds for children, for terraces, for bicycle lanes, for all those things that we're lacking for the moment and that would really improve uh, our city. Um, so to, to create and, and overlook the guidelines of our mobility, we, we need a strong public transport authority, of course, a role played by the by uh, Brussels Mobility, our, our PTA, and, and new means of transport in popping up and, and its role is, is, uh, is changing as, as never before. And, and thanks to our comprehensive view on mobility trends on operators and consumer, consumers needs, Brussels mobility is changing towards an MMA, a multimodal, a multimodal mobility authority and the next form of, of PTA. And that's really where we want to go um, together actually, because we need all the expertise, also the expertise, um, which is with you uh, all together here. Um, it's um, a new evolution. It's new to many of us and the interrogations are numerous and we want a strong, 
clear, simple, and, and future-proof regulatory framework. And that's a really important uh, part, but, but how do we get there? Where to start for this regulatory framework? And uh, when we heard the call for this project, we immediately seized the opportunity to get the best help we, we could uh, imagine because we really need to, to, to use all the brains, all the experience that exists to, to make this um, a success. And so even despite the coronavirus, we're very lucky this year because we have two great opportunities to help us understanding mass and preparing the future. And that this, this project with um, ITF and, and the MICE pilot project called Move Brussels um, that is now currently learning. So let me perhaps first tell you about this, this project that is, is running, uh, this, this pilot uh, that we're running for the moment. So we, we set up a full scale test to see how mass works and, and what lessons can be learned for the future. Um, the test will help us to establish the regulatory framework. That's, that's our goal. We want to create this framework and with all the, the questions um, that are the, behind it so that afterwards the mass application, it can be more applications of course, will be operational in Brussels. And what we want to do is use the, the customer experience feedback to create a really re re relevant and, and future-proof uh, framework um, for Brussels um, and that might also inspire perhaps others but that's really our goal. Um, we have decided to entrust the management of our pilots to the STIP, the public transport company. Um, they have the qualified personnel and, and the advanced techno technological uh, resources to do so. Um, we really want to give this test all its chances and, and currently we have about 2000 people who are testing the application. So it's really a test, it's, it's really a pilot. Um, and it's a good choice. I think I, I'm really happy that the STIP accepted to do this and, and it's really um, very, um, enthusiastic to do so um, for, for several reasons. I think uh, the STIP, our public transport, is, is a company with um, perhaps in, in the past a strong engineering culture where the customer experience was not always central. And, and in recent years, they really changed this. And the user of the STIP is, is returned really to the heart of the company's uh, strategy. And I think mass is part of that uh, as well. So we're really happy for that so they can even enforce this aspect. Um, the STIP also dares to, to step out of its comfort zone by developing actually an app that integrates other modes of transport. It's, it's including shared bicycles, scooters, taxis, everything. So the all players offering uh, mass and the company is thus addressing customers that are not only their own customers. And, and I think that's a courageous step. Um, and perhaps also um, mention one figure that in our country, we have a, a system that um, promote public transport subscription, subscriptions. We, we have a rate of 80% of subscribers on our lines and, and in comparison, for example, for London, where it's 20%. So it's an enormous rate of subscribers. Um, and, and that's actually um, a way to show that we, we still work too much in silos. Uh, I'm, I have a subscription, so I travel by tram. Uh, of, I, I don't have one, I go by bike. So we really have this identification to one mode of transport, which is really strong and, and often sometimes it even opposes one another uh, and, and we need to overcome that. And I think that the move from Brussels experience and this pilot experience is really breaking down these barriers between these, these mobility silos um, for the first time. And, and we really want to, to make a cultural revolution in it and making sure that for each, um, Time that people go from point A to B, they, they can really reflect in a multimodal way and, and make choices in function of what they really need and, and not just identifying to the one mode of transport that they're used to. And that's perhaps not always the most uh, efficient or the, the, the most um, interesting uh, modes of transport to use in every situation. Um, perhaps another um, aspect why I'm glad that the STIP is, is um, carrying out this, this project, um, it's because we know STIP is a very um, performance company and the satisfaction rate is, is very high for the moment. It's 7.1 um, out of 10 in 2019 and we see it's improving every year and we know that STIP wants to offer hap happy customers and, and in order to get this satisfaction rate you need to improve and you need to uh, be innovating and, and continue on progressing um, and so additional solutions for getting around in, in Brussels and and thus promote multimodal behavior will probably also increase this, this aspect and this satisfaction um, rate. So I think these are some really important aspects. So I'm glad that we can do this in good collaboration with our public transport uh, operator in um, Brussels. Um, of course, there's no doubt that this pilot and, and the, the ITF uh, project will lead to an innovative regulatory framework. Our goal is to have 
clear and simple rules that apply the same way to every operator active in Brussels, whatever the size, whatever, whatever the transportation mode. And so we have a framework in which afterwards the, the whole scale of operation of, of um, uh, transport modes can, can be, be used. Um, we hope it will allow the Brussels mobility to play really new role as, as MMA, as a multimodal mobility authority. We're really convinced we need to take that, that step. And I, that's why I want to thank everybody involved in this project, because as a minister, you can always take credit for everything that's happening, but the real work is, is happening by people. Maybe if, um, you, you will have a presentation uh, soon enough from, from Brussels Mobility, so I really want uh, to thank um, everybody, this tip, but also the people from my administration um, and the ITF for all the work that's behind this and, and it's being done. Um, I think um, Brussels Mobility, the, the, the administration um, has shown that they're really innovative and really want to go through with it. So well done and thank you very much. Um, perhaps let's already save the date at the end of the project to discover the first regulatory framework based on a real life size experience. And I hope that can be done live so we can see each other, we can meet each other, so I can show you the, the square that is behind me in, in real life. And it's a place we're very proud of in Brussels. And I hope then we can welcome you together with all the other tourists and that you can see what the impact is of this project and, um, and, and you can really take, get a taste of it in, in real life. Um, but that's uh, for the future. For now, I wish you a very interesting um, afternoon and, and lots of um, in exchange of good ideas and, and energy to uh, continue innovating. Thank you very much, Minister, and thank you for sharing the vision that our project aspires to contribute to. Uh, and indeed, just to say there will be a dissemination event. We will share the findings of the project and the report will be available for free download on the website when it is published. Uh, I will now share the message, the video message from uh, Director General uh, Nava. Hopefully this is visible and sound is working. Lieve mevrouw van den Brandt, dear Secretary General Jung Tai Kim, Mesdames et Messieurs, my name is Mario Nava and I am the Director General of DG Reform at the European Commission. It's with a great pleasure that I'm making these opening remarks for the webinar on developing innovative mobility solutions in the Brussels capital region. Now, I'm, as you may get from my accent, I'm originally from Milan, but Brussels happened to be the town where I've spent most of my life, happens to be the town where I've made my investment, happens to be the town where my three daughters are born, where they study, where they go to school, it happens to be the town where I live with my, with my family. It's a town that I adore profoundly. It's a very beautiful town and I've been here since 1994 and I think it has improved enormously. One of the reasons why it has improved, improved enormously is certainly a completely changed mobility. When I arrived here in 1994, the metro was smaller, the trams were not as capillar as they are today, the, the public transport as well. There, are no, there were no shared bikes, there were no shared cars, there were no uh, mobilities, uh, alternative, uh, alternative mobilities. Basically, it was either car or some, uh, or some public transport with much less, uh, much less frequency. The thing has improved uh, dramatically and I really want to begin by expressing my deep gratitude to the Ministry of Brussels Mobility for partnering with DG Reform on this project. It's not because things have improved that one needs to stop. It's exactly in that moment that one needs to continue improving. I'm also very grateful to the Secretary General and the International Transport Forum at the OECD for partnering with us and for sharing their unique international experience for this project. So overall, I think it is a collective thank you that I want to make to this uh, project. As you know, DG Reform is the DG of the Commission that has the mandate to bring down on the ground the policies of the Commission. The mobility policies is one of the most important policies and clearly we feel the responsibility of bringing this to the ground. We have worked and we are working with all the 27 member states 
Overall, we have more than a thousand projects around the different countries in Europe. And this project is, of course, very important, not least because we, we live here. My offices are in Rue de la Loi. This is what I see from the window. I hope you can see it. Here you see is the tunnel of Rue de la Loi is 352 on a, a normal Tuesday afternoon. And the tunnel outside Rue de la Loi is still blocked. So this project, I think, is very timely. The uh, COVID crisis is, of course, making us all reflecting about the, the mobility, the mobility in town and the mobility outside uh, outside town. And uh, I believe the COVID crisis has also sh seen a, a big shift away from cars to cycling pool. I live in, in Brussels in the, in the commune where uh, a certain Eddie Merckx had born and where a certain Eddie Merckx had, uh, had uh, gone around in bike, bringing bread around to, uh, to the clients of his, uh, of his dad. So I think uh, this town needs to honor the, the place of the, of the bicycle. But what is even more important, I think, in this project is really to have different modes of, uh, of mobility. And I really see it uh, in my, my daily life in this, uh, in this town that having different ways of moving around is essential. There could be a movement which is good by public transport, another one you simply walk, a third one you take a little bike, and so on and on. Even in the same trip, it could be, uh, it could be good to, to, change, uh, to change different modes. So the project, I think, is extremely important for the Brussels region. It's extremely important for the European policies. These enter perfectly into the green and the digital and the digital transformation. And uh, I need to, uh, I don't need to remind you because you all know it, that the green transformation implies that by 2050, the uh, emissions from the transport sectors will be reduced by about 90%. So this is a big target we have, uh, we have in front of us. And in order to realize that big target, we really need everybody to, uh, everybody to engage. As I said here, I think we are lucky because of the partners we have and because of the beneficiary we have. The beneficiary, Rao Van den Brand, but I would say the minister in general, if you allow me, the minister, the minister in general, I think it's, uh, um, it's all behind this project. And this is absolutely essential. The minister's participation to this uh, webinar underline the, the ownership, underline the strong commitment of Brussels mobility and of the Brussels capital region in the preparation and the implementation of this project. So I'm pretty convinced that today we are launching a project that will change these Town and will change the mobility in this town and for the better. For the success of the, of the project, what you need is a good plan, a good intention, but then really lots of commitment and lots of ownership. In closing, I really want to, to thank you. We have had great collaborations in general with the Belgian authorities, with the authorities from Wallonia, the authorities from Flanders and the authorities from the Brussels region and we really want to continue. Do count on us. The G reform will be there with you to, to assist uh, insofar as it, is, uh, as it is needed. And I'm really looking forward to see this project rolled out, developed, and possibly to meet you again at some closing event. Thank you very much. Have a very nice day. Thank you. And we are very grateful to DG Reform and to Director General Nava for sharing those comments. Uh, I will now ask our Secretary General, Young Tae Kim, to please uh, provide some introductory remarks from the ITF. Thank you, Ola. And good afternoon, Minister Van den Brandt, uh, Director General Nava, and all those in the audience today. I'm very delighted to be joining you for this webinar on this project for developing innovative mobility solutions in the Brussels capital region. And first, uh, firstly, I would like to thank Brussels Mobility and DG Reform for engaging with us for such an important and fascinating project 
on innovative mobility solutions. For those of you who might not familiar with the International Transport Forum, I will give you a small explanation about what we're doing and who we are. And ITF is an intergovernmental organization with currently 62 member countries. But among those 62 member countries, 44 countries are from Europe. So um, still uh, ITF is strongly Europe oriented, but we are now trying to become more globalized with uh, reaching out to non-European countries. Uh, so uh, even uh, during this difficult period in 2020, uh, we got two new members from Asia. They are Uzbekistan and Mongolia. And we are also a think tank for transport policy, uh, publishing more than 60 papers annually. And every paper published by ITF is freely downloadable from our website. So you can really have access to uh, the enormous uh, the information about transport issues from the past and even today. And also we organize an annual summit of transport ministers in Leipzig in Germany in May. But unfortunately this year we couldn't do it because of the COVID-19 crisis. And next summit will be organized on 26th to 28th May 2021 under the Irish presidency with the theme of innovation. And currently uh, ITF is focusing on five main themes uh, in the transport sector, but it goes definitely beyond the transport sector. They are digitalization and decarbonization and connectivity and universal access, including gender issue and safety and security. All those five themes are interconnected so if we want to achieve several goals, and I think uh, innovation mobility is a really important concept and strategy too. So innovative mobility services are great interest to, to our member governments right now. And also it's important to the uh, transport community in the world. Very recently, we have published work on many elements of mobility as a service, so-called mass, including shared mobility, managing public transport, integrating it with cycling, data-driven transport, and governance of algorithm, to give just a few examples. Especially our study covered cities like Dublin, Auckland, and Helsinki. So we already have some knowledge and experience of working with city governments. And I think that will be very useful to continue with this very important project for the Brussels capital region. And last week, the ITF hosted a roundtable discussion on integrating public transport into the mass ecosystem, which attracted a wide range of experts, including from Asia, Australia, North America, Europe, and Latin America. So we have also been working over the last several months with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development on a project looking at the way the new mobility landscape is developing in three continents, the Europe, Asia, and North America. So for us, there is no doubting how highly the question of innovative mobility ranks in the transport policy agenda. And we know that we are passing through a very difficult moment these days, the COVID-19 pandemic, but crisis is opportunity and we can really revisit the traditional transport system at the beginning of this uh, crisis, many countries uh, reacted immediately to cope with the uh, unexpected surprising event. But now we all agree that we need to reboot our system and in the long term, we have to reshape our policy approaches. And the concept of mass has been around for several years already, but there are still question marks over how best implement it. We still have uh, technical aspects and regulation issues, and also social issues, which is conflict between uh, the new mobility industry and uh, the existing uh, the, uh, business, businesses in the transport sector, like a taxi industry, for example. So we will bring all the expertise, experience, and learnings we have gathered from our international work over the years to contribute to developing robust frameworks in the Brussels capital region. 
But equally, we look forward to the future when Brussels capital region can be held up as an example for other cities looking to roll out mass. Especially uh, last September, we launched it, we finalized a uh, comprehensive uh, the policy review project for Estonian uh, transport policy. So that was uh, supported by European Commission and the project ended smoothly and with so much satisfaction for many uh, the stakeholders. And that was the first the comprehensive policy review project in ITF. And now we are moving forward to uh, Brussels project, which is the second the comprehensive uh, policy review project. And I'm sure that uh, this will bring a lot of insights and inspiration for policymakers in our member countries. And uh, we, uh, ITF staff, and even including myself, we learn more about the transport world and uh, we can all share a lot of important lessons together. So once again, I thank you so much for your support and interest and trust in ITF. And we will do our best to uh, produce uh, very nice uh, the fruit for everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Secretary General Kim. Uh, we will now move on to presentations uh, on the work. Uh, firstly, from Martin Lefranc of Brussels Mobility, who will talk to us about the ongoing work on mass, which is already underway in the Brussels capital region. And we will then hear from Philippe Christ of the ITF, uh, and he will speak specifically on the work and aims of this project. Uh, so Martin, if I could, um, oh, sorry, apologies. I would like to say, in fact, before we continue that there will be a chance to ask questions to our presenters and panelists um, at the, during the panel at the end. But if you do wish to ask a question, I would ask you to use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen, please. Um, and I would ask you please to submit your questions before the end of the presentations. Uh, Martin, if you would like to take it away now, thank you. Thank you very much, Ola. And Beforehand, I'd like to apologize. I, I seem to lose uh, my voice slowly since this morning, probably due to the excitement for, for the event. Uh, but I will go through the, the webinar without a problem, even if I have to go tone deaf. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Minister Van den Brandt, Director General Nava, Secretary General Kim for their speech and presence here today. This really means a lot to us for you to be here. So thank you very, very much. And we're also very glad to see that you're recovering so well, Minister Van den Brandt. Thank you again for being here despite the circumstances. So in case we haven't met yet, my name is Martin Lefranc. I work as the, Brussels, uh, the, as the Smart Mobility Coordinator for Brussels Mobility, and I'm involved in shared mobility and mobility as a service policies. And we're delighted and honored to have you here today and tell you more about what our ambitions are for us and what we're going to do to reach these ambitions. I see that we are all right, we just on 90 attendees, so that's really great turnout. Thank you so much. And before we really talk about mass, I have to highlight once again, the importance of our new sustainable urban mobility plan called Good Move. And uh, for that purpose, allow me to share my screen. There it is. Uh, I never ever miss a chance to promote Good Move. And now even more than ever, because it recently received a prestigious, prestigious prize, the SUMP Award from the European Commission. And this recognition is something that we're very proud of and gives us confidence and motivation to go full steam ahead in that direction. Good Move is the vision that has been defined for mobility and public space in the Brussels capital region for year 2030. It defines a mobility vision and a city vision that focus on, on and revolve around quality of life. And to make things short, the goal is to reduce the modal share of car uh, from about a third of trips to about a quarter. One of the many strengths of Good Move is the fact that it has been co-constructed and consulted with many stakeholders involved in mobility, as well as with uh, citizens. This approach, this Good Move spirit or Good Move momentum is definitely something that we want to keep going. And this is why we invited you today. We are here because we want to raise awareness about our mass intentions. We want to raise interest from stakeholders and we want to invite all of you to further contribute to the process in the future. So we're counting on you. If you, have, if you want to be active, an active player in the mobility space in Brussels, 
I strongly advise you to go check the Goodmove website and browse through the document. It's a tiny bit long. Uh, we have to we have to acknowledge that, but it's definitely worth it. And if you're willing to wait a little longer, an executive summary should be available next month for download in three languages, French, Dutch, and English. So make sure to go have a look. So as Good Move has become our guiding thread, our main theme for all of our actions and projects here at Brussels Mobility and the Brussels Capital Region in general, we are indeed adopting a more holistic approach to mobility. And we are seeing it as a system and not only considering different modes of transportation as separate silos, just as uh, Minister Van Ambrat said. So as we, as we said, Good Move is the goal and it divides in three main leverages, territory, behavior, governance, and six focuses, good neighborhood, good network, good service, good choice, good partner, and good knowledge. And mass is mainly concerned by the good service uh, focus, but it also resonates with good partner and good knowledge, of course. And for each of these focuses, uh, a certain amount of actions has been detailed as well. All in all, it is a set of 50 concrete and tangible actions that have been defined, uh, defined to make uh, the vision a reality by 2030. Among those 50 actions, let me highlight five of them that are related to shared mobility and mobility services uh, in the good service focus. There's uh, the support of the development of mobility as a service, the setting up of information points and integrated service hubs, develop services with respect to bicycle and micro mobility solutions, uh, service oriented approach to parking or parking as a service, reinforce shared mobility services. We strongly believe that mass is a powerful tool to reduce the car ownership rate and private car use. Basically that it is a powerful tool for the achievement of good move, of the good move vision. But it is only in combination with all of the other actions that the magic is really going to happen. The mass action, which bears number C1, for those who might be interested to, to read further into it, consists of two things. On the one hand, defining a local regional level uh, regulatory framework for the mass market, and on the other, developing a, a public digital and technological platform that facilitates and enables the mass system in the Brussels capital region. Both are pretty big challenges, but we consider the regulatory framework a particularly big challenge and quite an important reform when it comes to such a, a new and innovative topic uh, like mass. And this is why we applied with this project for the structural reform support program from DG Reform at the European Commission. And this is also why we ask for guidance and expertise in how to best adapt and define our shared mobility, new mobility, public transport, et cetera, and mass policies to increase our chances of making mass at a high scale, a reality. And we won. Thanks again, DG Reform for choosing us. Eventually, the current intention is to publish a new regulation, a new ordinance that will define the rules of the game for stakeholders in the mass landscape and how they interact between each other, how they share information, how they access the public transport ticketing, how they access and exit the market, et cetera, et cetera. The goal is to implement this regulation by the second semester of next year, 2021. And the regulation will of course, mostly rely on the ongoing work done in the projects we're presenting to you today. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about the International Transport Forum and why we partnered with them for this project. ITF's goal, such as uh, Secretary General Kim said earlier, is to define better transport policies to improve people's lives. And we thought this is really important to, to highlight and it is completely in line with the good move spirit. And this is also why we're very happy to have started to work with ITF's team on this project. So what is the project exactly? Well, I think the best person to talk about this uh, is our next speaker, Philippe Christ from ITF. But before I hand it over to Philippe, I'd like to tell just a quick anecdote uh, the first time I saw Philippe was last year in October at an event here in Brussels, which was Shared Mobility Rocks, which was really great, by the way. And he basically presented how the future of mobility could look like if we were using technology with a meaningful and clearly defined purpose. After I saw that presentation, I thought to myself, wow, okay, this is exactly the kind of person that we need to help us in this process. And ta-da, a few months later, 
thanks to the SRSP and DG reform, we were thrilled to be able to start working with Philippe and Orla and all of the ITF's team. So it is my great pleasure to leave the screen to Philippe Christ from, for him to dive further into the details of the project and highlight what the stakes are. Philippe, over to you. Excellent. Thank you very much for that introduction. Uh, I'm blushing a bit. Of course, you get me, but you get all of our team at the ITF, uh, all the people that are on this call, and of course, many people who aren't on this call, that are here to help the capital region of Brussels to chart that pathway to a better mobility future for the city. I'm going to share my screen now. One of the things that Secretary uh, Kim mentioned is that we do have 62 member countries that come to us and work with us around the table on issues that they face, transport policy issues that are really at the core of what they have to deliver for their people. There's a whole range of issues that have uh, come in recent years that are related to technology development and rapid technology development, whether it's automated driving, drones, digital regulation, micromobility, and of course, mobility as a service. And it's our role to help our member governments, both of course at the national level, but at the subnational level, like we are here in Brussels, to navigate that changing and uncertain world. And this is uh, what we are going to do uh, in the next few months uh, with Brussels. Let's start in Brussels. Brussels, like many cities, um, mobility uh, is not an easy domain of governments. Uh, but it is one that was not highly complex before. In order to get around, you could walk, of course, you could use your bicycle, you can use public transport, you can drive as, as a, about a third of the population does. Uh, you can use trucks and vans for goods delivery. Now that, let's call it relatively simple world of transport has become much more complex in recent years with the arrival of many new mobility services that leverage these technologies, um, bike share, car share, ride sourcing, scooter sharing, uh, drones, delivery bots that we don't see yet in the streets of Brussels, but that I imagine at one point we will. All of these become part of a range of choices that become available to citizens in getting around. And they leverage, of course, this underlying digitalization in society that uh, is present in our cities, but it's also present in our pockets with our smartphones. And this digital interface makes all of this possible. At the same time, it also creates challenges going forward in terms of new technologies that we do not yet see on our streets, including automation, um, and some technologies that are in the background of what we see on our streets and in our cities, like the technologies linked to artificial intelligence. All of these are converging in the city, in Brussels, uh, in our pockets, and all of these have impacts on our behavior and have impacts as well on these issues that Minister Van den Brandt spoke about sustainability, equitability, equit equitability, and livability in our cities. At the heart of this, when we talk about technology, we cannot forget, as we've heard, the human element. Those technologies, in the end, must make these city environments better for the people that live in them. And this is the heart of what the ITF aims to do, is to bring this back to what are these technologies and how might these services deliver a better set of solutions, a better set of choices for people as they get around their day-to-day -day life. So let's start with you and I, you and me, the people that are at the heart of this and talk about how mobility choices are offered today. We have, of course, every day, a range of choices. We can take a bicycle or a shared bicycle, take a car, take a ride sourcing car, all of these are available. But when we interact with each of these, it's through a single line of communication, through different silos, through bilateral links. And all of this, of course, makes switching from one to the other difficult, not impossible, but difficult. One can imagine a future, as many have, as the city of Brussels is engaging with, a platform that allows a uniform gateway to multiple services. And this uniform gateway confederates, brings together a number of services microservices, if you will, that are related to the delivery of the mobility services. That includes secure identification, it includes routing information, it includes ticketing and booking and payment information, it includes um, recourse uh, and liability um, rules, it includes customer service. All of these linked through a single digital interface that allows people to access these multiple services. Of course, 
with this platform comes a lot of value. And this is what we've seen around the world that whoever controls the platform controls that value. And that value can be a private value or it can be a public value. In the former case, uh, there is a risk and an understandable um, motivation for certain actors in the commercial sphere to hold and to own that platform in a walled garden where they curate those who can come in and who can participate and also derive all that value. And I think the approach that uh, Brussels Mobilité has outlined is uh, a preferable option where we see the platform as a public good or the different types of platforms that can be developed as public goods. So this project aims to support the development of the mobility as a service uh, framework for the Brussels capital region and specifically assist Brussels mobility in establishing an efficient and resilient regulatory framework for mobility as a service, as we've heard from Martin. And this project brings together three elements. There is, of course, a governance element. There is the technology and new mobility services element. And there's the people, the people that uh, have to benefit from the system. The project seeks to find appropriate governance frameworks to help guide the technology deployment and the technology-based services deployment in support of the people living in the Brussels capital region and those that are using the Brussels capital region as they enter and exit every day. We will, in the end, deliver a set of specific policy recommendations on both the regulation frameworks and data governance, which is a key element in delivering a successful mobility as a service framework, the data governance element of that. The project will look at four specific um, elements. It will review international experiences in developing these type of mobility as a, as a service frameworks, experiences in Helsinki, experiences in Vienna, experiences in Berlin and other cities. We will look at uh, the readiness of the Brussels capital region by developing a readiness assessment to see if the necessary building blocks are in place. And if not, um, how might they be put in place and who should have responsibility for them? We will look, of course, at a range of data governance frameworks. This is, again, a key aspect in, in the mobility as a service value proposition and develop guidance uh, for Brussels Mobilité and for the Brussels Capital Region for their development. And finally, as we are today, um, we'll be consulting stakeholders via a number of meetings, a review workshop, and bilateral meetings with many of you. Um, we'll be reaching out to you after this meeting in order to have those discussions so that we can ensure that we represent as many of the views of all stakeholders in this process. And as we've heard, this is of course a project that is carried out with generous funding from the European Union via the Structural Reform Support Program uh, as uh, we heard in the opening. So this is the reason for this project. It is what this project will be doing. Um, but it is also just the very beginning of this project. And the success of this project will, of course, entail uh, the work that we do with Brussels Mobilité, the engagement that we have um, with a number of mobility operators, but more broadly with all of the stakeholders that are interested in becoming involved with this process. And for that reason, we look forward to working with you uh, in the future, in the next coming weeks and months. Thank you very much. Thank you both very much for providing us with an introduction to the context in terms of ongoing work and to the specifics of the project um, and the aims for it going forwards. Now, we've uh, had you listening to us for the last 40 minutes. It's time for some audience participation. Uh, Emer, if you could launch the poll, please. You will see now on your screen a poll with four short questions. Uh, this is just a quick poll to gauge the background opinions of the stakeholders who have joined us today, and I can assure you it is fully anonymous. Um, as Philippe mentioned, we do hope that you will engage with us further after the webinar to provide more detailed input um, for the project from your perspective. But in order to inform this initial discussion among panellists, we're just looking for some quick reactions in the moment to some key topics uh, among those of you in the audience. And while those responses are coming in, uh, I would also like to invite Martin and Philippe to join us again to discuss the results and to invite Francois Joseph van Oudenhove from Arthur D. Little Strategy Consultants to join the panel as well. 
and uh, Francois Joseph was involved in the original development of the mass strategy for the Brussels capital region and has international experience of developing strategies for mass. And Francois Joseph, you are very welcome. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Okay, we'll just give it a few more moments now for anyone who wishes to submit their responses. And we have about three quarters of our attendees have voted now, so um, just a few more moments for anyone else who wishes to vote. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, Emer. If you could close the poll, please, and launch the results so everyone can see them. Okay, so just a brief run through. Um, the response is the majority of, uh, of respondents uh, think this is, is a roughly expect 30% market share by 2030. So that's the first question looking at the potential user market out there. Uh, then in terms of the regulatory approach, again, we have about three quarters of respondents who feel that the existing regulations are not currently fit for purpose in terms of getting mass started in the short term. Um, but a clear majority believe it is necessary to have an open ecosystem in the data governance approach, and 94% of respondents believe the city has a role to play in this ecosystem. So these are some very interesting results, I'm sure, to take forwards into our panel discussion. Um, I think we can stop sharing the results now so that everyone can see the panelists' faces as we speak. Okay, so um, so the response to that first question on the user market, Francois Joseph, perhaps you could give us some view from your international perspective um, on 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 different cities. Do, is, do you think this is generally reflective of stakeholder attitudes to mass at this time? Well, I think it's difficult to give a figure uh, because it's uh, we are projecting uh, projecting ourselves. Um, I think the success of mass will depend uh, on the ability to develop. Uh, a solution that is sufficiently attractive in comparison with individual car. And because the idea of, of mobility as a service is that people will actually uh, use mass as an alternative to ownership. Uh, and so I think that's uh, setting already 35% uh, or 30% uh, uh, for, for majority of people and still quite some people uh, uh, thinking that it will go further is quite, uh, is quite ambitious uh, and it's a good thing. Uh, and I think the ability to achieve that will depend uh, on the enablement, uh, because everyone, all the stakeholders needs to work together, uh, starting from the authority, but also the private stakeholders to make sure that together we build a solution that is sufficiently attractive so that we don't only have individual cars as default. Uh, and, and I think one of the secret there will be to probably include to some extent the individual car into the system itself. But so you know, I, I think it's uh, it's quite a positive uh, mindset uh, to start with. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much, um, Philippe. Uh, have you any further thoughts on on this idea that it is it is neither remaining niche nor overtaking the entire mobility market in the next decade? Well, I think that's uh, that's clear, and it shows that a lot of the behaviors that uh, um, people have already in transport. Uh, are often difficult to change. And uh, so having simply offering a application interface that allows you to have seamless uh, options of transport doesn't mean that you'll change your behavior. Uh, one of the great things, uh, or one of the, the things that makes Brussels an interesting case 
is that um, the city is working beyond the digital interface and is actually reworking the physical interface of the city in order to um, not to penalize or to facilitate travel, but really to deliver a city as its inhabitants um, would want in a city that generates more welfare and better outcomes for them. And when that happens, then that makes the digital interface um, more likely to be one that you turn to uh, because the physical environment uh, facilitates that. So I think uh, my own answer to that question was uh, the second 30% market share, but trending towards a higher market share as it becomes easier and easier to use the digital interface as Francois Joseph says, instead of a car. Uh, or instead of sometimes a single public transport trip when it might be better to use a half shared bicycle, half public transport trip. Um, and, uh, and so I think that's, that's a promising um, message that we're getting from the poll here. Great, thank you very much. And Martin, these are your users. You are probably most familiar with the user market among those of us here. So uh, what are your thoughts on this response from your stakeholders? Well, it's a very uh, promising and, and uh, positive uh, result. I think, I don't remember the numbers exactly, but a big, a huge majority was voting for options two and three, uh, which shows a lot of confidence in the sector. So even despite the current situation, the current crisis that has a lot of impact on the, on the sector, uh, it shows a lot of confidence. So I think it's really positive. And I think it's definitely one of these win-win situation or hopefully even win-win-win situation between us, the public authorities, uh, the mobility or uh, uh, mobility solution providers sector and the end customer uh, to facilitate the use of all the, the offer of mobility. So this, these numbers are really enthusiastic and, and positive for the future. We really, uh, I'm happy to see those results. Great, thank you very much. Um, okay, were there any other comments anyone wished to make on that question? No? Okay. Um, so the second question, which was around the regulatory approach, very high level, obviously the actual approach is far more nuanced than a yes or no question. However, as, a, as, a, as an indicator among the stakeholders, we're seeing that about three quarters of respondents um, felt that the existing regulations are not yet fit for purpose to get mass going straight away. So Martin, if I can come back to you again on this, um, reflecting on your work so far and the work for the mass strategy, have you any thoughts on this response? Well, I, I totally understand the, the result of this of the second question because uh, the, the intention is still to and remains uh, to create one additional regulatory framework, one additional uh, level of, of uh, uh, regulation to coordinate and, and regulate the mass market. But the further we go into the project, the, the further into details, we, we have a look at the existing regulations, we realize that other re existing regulations could benefit of our uh, basically uh, uh, bring them up, bring up, bringing up uh, to date uh, to have better coherence between the existing regulations. For example, the topic of data sharing, uh, we definitely can see that the different regulations about shared mobility appeared at different stages of the evolution of these new mobility services. And at the time, the technology was different, the approach was different, uh, and the idea, the concept of mobility as a service was maybe not already in, in people's minds. So you can feel that it, it wasn't thought out uh, completely for uh, mass readiness. So definitely, I understand this, the, the result. I actually voted for the same, uh, same uh, answer as well. I think uh, other uh, policies and other regulations should get reviewed in this process. Okay, excellent, thank you. And Francois Joseph, you have a kind of a view on this from um, multiple different cities. Is this, would you say, generally the approach that, that has been taken? That um, as Martin says, uh, the, the regulations to date have evolved um, piecemeal as they were needed for, for different modes or different demands. Uh, and, and as such, they are, are not necessarily in a position simply to fire the starting pistol. I, th I think the, the, good, the good thing with what is going on now in, in Brussels is that there is a strong link between mass and, and the overall mobility policy in the city. I mean, we, we really see the integrations between these initiatives and the overarching good move initiatives. And I think there are indeed a number of avenues that need to be investigated. Uh, and data sharing, I think, is one of them, uh, because we need to ensure that there is bidirectional exchanges 
between the, the, the mass backend and, and all the MSP uh, so that we can really optimize the flow uh, in the interest uh, of the system as a whole. I think one element that may be investigated as well that is not yet the case is um, trade-based subsidies, for instance, trying to assess to which extent we could subsidize some of the MSP uh, trips, which may not be financially viable, but which might be socially contributing. I mean, this is something that is possible only when the authority is taking a strong role, and I think that's the case here. And then finally, I think um, you mentioned, Philippe, about the infrastructure, I think it's critical. Uh, another point is mobility demand management. Uh, and I think if we want actually to change behavior, uh, we also need to adapt further and continue. Uh, we already started in Brussels uh, to have additional regulatory measures to actually incentivize people to move towards uh, more sustainable mobility options. Uh, and that's also part, in a way, of mass, because mass is not an application. Mass is a change of behavior triggered by digital and physical. Uh, so, so I think, yes, uh, and I think that's very much the objective of this of this uh, stream of work that you will be doing with ITF, so I, I think it's great. Great, thank you. Philippe, do you have anything to add on this point? I would just point out that uh, when we look around our membership, our 62 member countries, we see that um, when it comes to big bang regulatory approaches that deal with mobility, urban mobility in particular, um, there are some countries that have engaged this at the national level. So Finland in the rewrite of their transport code, France in the um, new or relatively new Loi d'Orientation de Mobilité have really sought to reset the regulatory framework at the national level on down. Now, of course, um, Belgium is a special case with uh, a range of different governments and strong um, uh, responsibilities for each of those member governments. But I think one of the things to look forward is when you think about the regulatory overhaul, not to forget those actions that must be taken at the national level because they do set the framework. That's the, the only thing I would say in response to that question. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much. I am conscious of our time, so we're going to take questions three and four together. Uh, and these were the questions relating to the data governance approach. So we had 82% of respondents felt that it is necessary to have an open, day, um, open ecosystem. This is where all actors share their data with each other. Um, and 94% felt that the city had a role in managing this. So Philippe, I'm going to come back to you because you've done quite a bit of work in this area of late. Um, what do you think of this response and, and what are the most urgent hurdles do you think to overcome? So I think this is entirely um, to be expected. It reflects the, the discourse on this subject matter around Europe, around the world, in fact. Um, uh, is it necessary to have an open ecosystem? Yes, we believe so. Uh, where all actors share their data? Yes, but that doesn't mean all actors share all their data. And so when it comes to data sharing because of privacy and because of commercial sensitivity reasons, there has to be a clear mapping if it's business to business sharing, mandated business to business sharing or business to public authority sharing. There has to be a clear mapping of what the purpose of that sharing is for. And what is the public outcome that can be generated by having that shared? So rather than having blank mandates to require operators to share their data um, with each other or with governments, we really have to think about what specific reason uh, do we have for mandating that data sharing. So that's, I think, the first thing. And should the city have a role? Yes, they should have to have a role. Um, public authorities should have a role. And in particular, they should have a role making sure that the basic building blocks are in place. And in many cases, including in Brussels as well, some of those basic building blocks are not there yet. And so that will be part of this work that we'll be doing is identifying those building blocks and making sure that the public authority has deployed them so that other actors in the mobility ecosystem can build on that with their data sharing. Thank you. Um, Martin, would you like to add anything to that from the specific Brussels Capital Region perspective? Yes, the, the, the question about the role of the city was the question I feel the most, and I'm really relieved to see the results. Uh, an overwhelming majority of yes, uh, and I really think, I really, really believe it is super important that we have a role in this, um, because we do have an obligation. Uh, as we said, again, good move is our vision. It has been co-constructed with so many uh, stakeholders and uh, citizens. It has been approved by actually two successive different uh, governments. And we have an obligation as a, as a public authority to, to make this vision happen. And as we said, mass is definitely one of the uh, powerful tools that we have at our disposal to make it happen. Uh, so thank you for saying yes to this question. Uh, and I also understand why the 
uh, the first question had so, such a positive result. I think it's it, to, to able to contribute and to gain value uh, between the different stakeholders, this system, this uh, open system is, is really relevant. Okay, excellent, thank you. And for, so Francois Joseph, I see you nodding along there. Do you have anything that you'd like to add um, to, to this topic? Uh, one, one final comment, I, I, I think, I personally strongly believe, I mean, that it is important that cities are standing up and actually that they, they, they play a role in, in, in actually building a virtuous mass uh, system. Uh, and I think what is great with the situation in Brussels, and that's not there, that's not, like, not like that in, in every city, is that they say directly, we don't want to go into the walled garden uh, situation. I mean, we want to open up. So to maximize actually the success for the benefits of all. Uh, which means, and that's very important because it's even before they detail everything, they have a clear vision and they say, we want actually an open ecosystem and we want to allow others to actually also be active. And, and I think that's a very, very good starting point. And I'd like to congratulate uh, the Brussels Mobility uh, for this vision. Okay, excellent. Thank you very much. Now, I am conscious that we have run over the hour um, and we, we did have some questions come in. Looking through them, I think the themes of the questions have been largely addressed by our panelist responses. We have some on data sharing, some on um, uh, mobility demand management, such as uh, disincentivizing car use. Um, but the, the and, and Francois Joseph, you've touched on the theme that I, I think is, is uh, several questions here in front of me, is the difference between the Brussels mobility approach in general and that which has been uh, adopted in other cities. So you mentioned that the, the difference between the, the approach in the Brussels capital region compared to the walled garden approach. Um, so I think perhaps, um, Mark, maybe if you could give us a, maybe a brief overview of the approach uh, as set out in, in, in the strategy that the Brussels Capital Region will be taking. I'm not going to ask you to make it as distinct from other cities because I, I, I don't think that's uh, particularly fair in the format that we have now, but if you could just maybe give an overview for those in the audience so they know what the, um, what the approach is, please. Well, um... I don't know exactly how the other cities works. For example, I see in the in the Q and A sessions a uh, question about Berlin. Um, uh, if we compare it specifically to Berlin, I think we would be definitely more open. We uh, have defined in a guidance paper uh, for a strategy about mass, which which is available. So don't hesitate to uh, to ask us uh, uh, to to share it with you. But we have defined uh, the the role of Brussels mobility. And the role also as our public transport operator, STIB MIVB, uh, which will carry out and, and support the development of a uh, public digital and technological uh, platform, which it would be the back end platform for the mass uh, system. Um, the details of which must be definitely defined in the process that we are uh, currently doing here uh, at ITF. But the role of uh, the STIB MIVB is very important to set up this, this pl platform. But um, there's also different stakeholders and different profiles, such as mobility, mobility solution providers or mass providers or aggregators, that, for which uh, we have to define also the interactions between, between us, between the platform and between each other. Uh, and the particular role of STIB MEVB is that they will play uh, at different scales. So we have to define their role as well from each perspective. Uh, so that's, that's quite a challenge, I think, quite a big challenge, and, and the input of uh, all the stakeholders present here today will be very important to, to set the right uh, balance between uh, the value for each, uh, each of the stakeholders. Excellent, thank you. And I think that is a good note to bring things to a close on. I sincerely apologize to everyone that we didn't get to address questions individually. However, I hope that's an indication that we're leaving you wanting more. Um, Unfortunately, as we are out of time, we, we won't get to delve into this any further today. However, we will follow up with everyone who's registered by email um, with details of how you can engage with the project and provide your input in more detail over the next number of weeks. Um, I would like to thank our panelists um, and Minister Van den Brandt, Director General Nava, and Secretary General Kim, and all of you who joined and stayed with us. I apologize again for those of you who had difficulty joining at the beginning and uh, for any issue with the links uh, in the invitation. But I do hope that I will be speaking with you again soon. Thank you very much. Thank you. And a quick shout out to Ola and Aima for getting this, uh, making this happen. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Great job.